Good evening, everyone. I am Mr. Banta, grandstand teacher at the Gateway School, and for about the next 90 minutes, a most fortunate host of our school's alumni panel. In just a moment, I will introduce you to five exceptional young adults who have accomplished so much, both during their times at Gateway and beyond. I am honored to connect you with them tonight and to learn a bit about what each of them have been up to since their time at Gateway. This is life after Gateway. Please join me in welcoming from the class of 2017, Luca Daly. From the class of 2015, Jordan Cohen. From Gateway class of 2011, Neve Ferguson. From the class of 2007, Olivia Giuliano. And finally, from the class of 2003, Anna Garner Kaminsky. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us here tonight. <laughs> thank to you so much you. for having us here. Thank you. Yeah. thank you for having us. Thank you. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to each of you for a couple of moments mm -hmm. to find out what you've been up to, get a little bit about your background from your time at Gateway, and then, of course, there are some audience questions, too. Parents and students out there would love to know, what was it like when you were in school? Then, what did you do after your time at Gateway? And also, what are you up to now? So, taking it one by one, we're going to go in order of your class year. We'll begin tonight with Luca. We'll travel over to Jordan, then to Neve and Olivia, and we'll finish with Anna. Now, as we get to know you a little bit better and connect you with the audience, let's begin with Luca. Luca, would you give us a little bit of background about who you are, other than Luca Daly, class of 2017? Hi, so as mentioned before, um, my name is Luca Daly. I was in the graduating class of 2017 at Gateway. Um, I was there since the fifth grade, so for about four years. I'm currently finishing up my time at the Dwight School in New York as part of my high school adventure. And then I will be soon uh, moving on to Bennington College in order to study uh, fashion design and printmaking and digital design. Awesome. And Luca, do I understand correctly, you have sort of your own design empire brewing? Yes. Um, back in ninth grade, when, uh, when I was when I left Gateway and headed on to Dwight, I met um, a, I met a couple people who wanted to help start a clothing brand and I um, presented myself as a up and coming fashion designer and um, started designing from there and to the day it's now a functioning uh, company called Daffodils in Paradise. Yeah, we have a whole clothing line and I'm the uh, lead designer and artistic director. Fantastic. Congratulations on that. You must be very proud. Mm -hmm. Jordan, how about you, my friend? How are you? And tell us a little bit about what you're up to right now. Mr. Banta, I'm doing well, thank you. So I started at the Gateway School in kindergarten before transferring to the Birch Watham Lennox School in 2012. I'm currently a sophomore at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business, studying finance, economics, and history. I'm currently recruiting for real estate credit, real estate private equity, and investment banking internships and jobs. That's awesome. Now, which do you think you might go for? Are you feeling one way or another right now? Real estate or investment banking? Or are you still undecided? So my preference right now is a career in real estate acquisitions. Awesome. Well, I wish you very good luck with that. And I'm sure whatever you choose, you're going to get it. Thank you. No problem. Neve, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am all right here tonight. So class of 2011, that's about a decade out now. Tell us a little oh bit about God. you. What's going on? <laughs> um, I just wrapped uh, working as a COVID compliance officer on the NBC show Manifest, eight o'clock on Thursdays. Um, tune in season three, respite's on Hulu or Peacock. And uh, I went to York Prep after Gateway. I was there for just middle school, sixth to eighth grade. 
And then I went to Bennington College and transferred uh, to Emerson College and uh, graduated in the pandemic um, right in the beginning, headed to LinkedIn, networked and got myself on a TV show. Fantastic. Good for you. And what was that like to graduate college, let alone any other place in the middle of the pandemic? It was it was weird. Um, it definitely was interesting. I was in L.A. interning for Conan. So we had to they were like, you're all going home from L.A. And I was like, you're sending me into the epicenter. Thank you. Um, and it was kind of weird. Graduation. They just put our bill, our names on a building and called it graduation. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm happy to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Olivia, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good. In fact, um, Olivia, I look at your graduating year and it reminds me of the time that about I started at Gateway, I think 2006, 2007. That's been a bit now. What's going on with you these days? So I started out actually before I went to Gateway at Birchwell Athletic School. And I realized, or my parents realized right away that that wasn't a good fit for me because of my special needs. So when I went to Gateway afterwards, I went back to Birchwell Athletic School and I graduated there, went to Connecticut College, and I now work at the Hospital for Special Surgery. And I am going to do my master's um, at Columbia University for occupational therapy. That's fantastic. Are you thinking of possibly doing OT in a school setting, or do you have, are you sort of undecided about where that might play out? I'm sort of undecided. They tell you to keep a really open mind when you go into school because you do all these different field work opportunities where they expose you to different settings. So they tell you to really keep an open mind. So I'm trying not to pick, but it is kind of tempting to say pediatrics because of my gateway background, but we'll see. That makes sense. Well, good luck with that too. Thank you. Anna, good to see you. How are you today? I'm good, how are you? I am well, you are our 2003 class thereof. It's yes. been quite, probably quite a bit for you. Yes. What do you what do you want to say about what you're doing right now and uh, where you're at? Yeah, because high school was a long time ago, but uh, <laughs> yes, so I am currently getting my master's degree, uh, master's of art and teaching for special ed. Uh, I would like to do become a, I'm going for my special ed generalist license for upper school. So that's seventh to 12th grade. And ideally I would like to work with kids who have both learning disabilities and are English language learners. But for now I'm, I'm loving it. I work as a, and I work as an assistant teacher in a high school. And uh, yeah, I'm working with kids that basically were not lucky enough to go to Gateway. It's based All right, fantastic. And congratulations and thank you so much for the hard work you're doing during the pandemic. Thank you very much. Now, this is the point in the show where we're gonna speak a little bit one-on-one -on -one with each of you. There are some questions we've thought about prior to this presentation. We'll spend a little bit of time doing that one-on-one. -on -one. And then we'll all come back together as there are also some community questions. And I may even have one or two questions from some current students at the very end. Mm -hmm. So following our order of class year, Luca, are you OK with that being first up? Absolutely. All right. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. All right. As everyone else heads on out to the back room, Luca, good to see you here again on the screen one on one. My question for you would be specifically about one of your favorite gateway memories. Now, I'm not saying it has to be a field trip, and it may not necessarily be a grandstand, a lesson, or even a project. Perhaps it's a teacher. But when you think about it, what is one or two memories that really stand out for you when you think about your time at Gateway? So, oh my. This was actually when I was reviewing a lot of the questions and I realized that um, this one was the hardest to answer. And I was like, by all means, this is going to be my favorite answer. I have two of them. Uh, of course, there are many memories that I, I absolutely cherish. But my two most favorite, the first one is one of the earliest I can remember is um, building in grandstand with the wooden blocks. I don't recall the name of the wooden blocks. They're just generic wooden blocks, but building these very large um, skyscrapers uh, in grandstand during recess and getting to really connect with other kids and expand and build. And that really just helped 
it, it originally I wanted to do architecture before going into fashion and this helped me build on my prior learning skills and connect with people. And I remember it got to a point where uh, the teachers asked for us kindly not to build on the staircase where people walked. Um, that was a very interesting conversation, but just having that time to just play and build and be creative was honestly one of my favorite memories. And the second one came on kind of the opposite end uh, during my last couple months at Gateway. Um, I was, I asked um, Mr. Matias, who was, was our, my wonderful art teacher, if I could uh, make a large uh, painting for graduation. And with only like two or three weeks left, he said, absolutely go right ahead. So um, I ended up create, with the help of Mr. Matias and a couple of the students create um, a painting of a, of a concert of a musical concert and just those two weeks of coming after school and even during school painting really were I, I reminisce of those and that's one of the memories where I realized that I kind of wanted to start going into art and fashion so I, those two were like my favorite memories of all time I gave that's away. awesome I'm definitely sensing that theme of creation and building and it seems like given a set of materials you certainly know how to put something together Thank you might be happy to know that we've still got so many of those building blocks and you know as covid restrictions releases i think one of the things the children are most looking forward to is beginning to be able to do some of that stuff again together so if i hear of any things being built on the staircase i'll be happy to let the current students know it hey, luca will be the first to tell you don't build on the staircase <laughs> but i will let them know that they are participating in a grand legacy of construction using some of the same blocks that you yourself used so many years ago now. Absolutely. Thank you, Luca. And now I'd like to bring back to the, uh, back to the screen, Jordan, because I've got a question for Jordan too. Jordan, good to see you again. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Nice to see you again as well. All right, now Jordan, here it is. It's all about advice, advice to current students, perhaps students who are reaching the end of their gateway career, and about to go on to new schools, or maybe some younger students who are just getting started out at the Gateway School. What advice do you wish you had received prior to going to Gateway? Or if it's a better answer or question, what advice would you give to current students about what you now know? Yeah, so I mean, this has been really helpful. The advice I would give them is to remember the importance of the 10,000 hours rule. I would recommend getting as much reading, writing, and mathematical experience as possible to really develop those skills. I regret having such a strong phobia of reading when I was younger and avoiding the and not doing the assigned reading in Ms. Brown's class. Another piece of advice I'd really like to give them is to understand the importance of taking the time to reflect. Instead of following the herd, I really feel I could have identified pursuits that are meaningful to me. Now, when you think back about those early reading assignments and you were a younger guy, is there anything you think that would have made it a little bit easier or anything that would have cajoled you to perhaps, all right, I'll do that reading? I feel really finding a literature that was definitely more entertaining and more exciting could have been helpful. I agree. I, I find it so much easier to interact with the stuff that I find interesting. And if I find something that's a bit of a chore, I feel the same way. I understand you about that. Now, you're, however, I imagine in college now, you're doing a whole bunch of reading. Yeah, I mean, I read mostly at night. I mean, I just finished the Caesar's Palace coup, which was excellent on the Caesar's Entertainment LBO and the battle between the creditors and Apollo and TPG. That's awesome. I'm so glad that the material that you're able to interact with in your coursework and in and around speaks to you and the things that you find the most interesting. I think that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. All right, we'll check back in with you again soon, but now I think we're gonna hop over to our friend, Neve. Neve, are you there? Hey, Neve. Hey. What is going on? How are you? I'm good, you? I'm all right. I'm thinking about our gateway building. Now, you know, you were one of the first classes to inhabit our building on West 61st Street. And so I have to think, 
when and if you visit the Gateway School, what brings you back there? What do you go back to see? And the next time you go back, what would you like to see new? I, when I think of the building, I just think of like the open space that it is. I, I went to York Prep after, and of all, like I love York Prep and everything about that. Uh, it very much was in an old church. So it was very like small hallways, very claustrophobic in a way. And whenever I think about Gateway's building, I kind of just, I'm like, that was the coolest building ever. Like there was so much light going into it. The windows were huge. Like uh, I'm the nooks like in the library are probably like, my, my favorite, like just like taking a book and like kind of squeezing into the wall, like a mouse. I love that. Um, I used to actually, come by and visit like all the time when I was in like I graduated uh, like the first year out because I still had friends there and I'd be like hey and they'd be like you have to call first and I'd be like oh yeah of course like I forgot um so I mean I would love to come back like I always kind of dreamed of doing a grandstand it's like being important <laughs> to do a grandstand uh like other students came back and did so I think I mean, I'd love to like once all COVID precautions and all of that and the world is back somewhat to normal to come back and also do a grandstand. Like I was, I love those. Um, but also just to see, like, I think you guys have added on more floors and I honestly, like I'm also a fan of ar ar architecture. So like, I would love to see like how the top floors connect to like the bottom. Well, Neve. I'll offer you a two for one. If you come back, please help us out with a grandstand. We would love to have you. And then second, when we're done there, perhaps we'll take a stroll on over to the cafeteria. You could take a look at the menu and you can try out some of the food. <gasps> you could, wait, you have a food there? Yes, uh, it, it, when things are back to normal, food comes on in. You can come and pick out from the menu after our grandstand and we can talk about how you think it went. Oh, 100%. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Start thinking about that because, you know, you're involved in so many great things in production and so many of our kids are so interested in TV and movies. I think it would be a great connection to be able to answer their questions about what it really looks and feels like, as well as give them some information about the stuff that you've learned. Yeah, I'd love to. All right. Awesome. It's a deal. As soon as everything's good to go, we'll make it happen. And, um, so I'd also, however, like to take some of these questions and circle it back to some of our other speakers. So for instance, if you would like to perhaps also answer, what would you like to see if you came back to the Gateway School or what would draw you back to visit? Please come on in and let me know. Yes, we have a fantastic cafeteria and a brand new grandstand, but perhaps there's something else or somebody else that you'd be interested in coming to see. So if something speaks you, please come on in and let me know. Don't feel like because I'm on one question that you can't come on in and also give your thoughts. But, oh, Olivia. Hi. Hey. <laughs> All right, everyone's back in. All right, I think this is good. This is nice to have everyone with us. We mm -hmm. were just talking about the Gateway facility itself. Mm -hmm. All of us have been there and seen what it has looked like recently. A lot of us have not been there to see all of the new changes that have taken place. So is there a person? Is there a thing? Is there a spot in the building or something you'd be interested in coming down to check out? Or do you have any goals for what you wish could happen inside of a school nowadays? Um, for me, it's always the people. I love the people that, you know, I grew up with. You know, I went to Gateway from 2002 to 2007, so from 8 to 13. And so I'd love to see, you know, the teachers, um, I probably don't know any of the students anymore, but I'd love to see, you know, the old teachers that I had when I was there. And I'm also interested to see how the curriculum has changed, if any, I don't know if they've done anything different to it. So I'd be very interested to sit in on a few classes and just see what the curriculum is like and um, how like the musicals are. The musicals were a really big part of um, my time at Gateway. So I'm curious how like the theater and the sports aspects and how that have changed or stayed the same. And Anna, how about you? Oh, I think you might be on mute, but that happens when we're on these platforms. Yeah, story. And thank you, Olivia. Welcome. Um, I 
I think most of my teachers are retired or not working at Gateway anymore, but as a someone who's studying to become a special ed teacher, I would just, it would be just such a treat to just sit down and watch the Gateway method uh, in action, I guess, uh, to see grandstand, but not as a student, but as somebody who's studying to become an educator. That would just be a real treat. I think that would be awesome if you also came to visit and I think we could probably pull off just that. Hey, Luca, I see your hand up. Go right ahead. Um, with the, the building question, well, yes, I, I do love to, I would love to also go back and visit all of my teachers. Um, one, one portion of the building that drew me was the elevator. And I know this sounds really interesting, but uh, whenever I'm rushing to school or I would come down to the basement or to enter the elevator, there would this be moment on the way up from the ground, from the basement to the sixth floor where I would get into a mindset of I'm entering school or if I have something that I have to remember for school, I'll remember it while I'm in the elevator. And then when the doors of the elevator open up and you see the gateway logo, I, I feel like I, I personally just get inspired to re-enter back into school and work and try my best to succeed. So just having that moment of, I would say clarity in the elevator and then the doors opening to see the logo and starting and getting back into the field of work just inspires me every time. So when COVID restrictions start to slowly unwind, I would absolutely love to come back and visit. That would be awesome. Love to be there as you take that first ride back up and go after so many years and have those doors open. And yep, you are correct. The logo is right there waiting just beyond those glass doors. One of the things that I um, did recently before yes. COVID, um, actually January 2020, so right before um, COVID really um, you know, snowballed, was I actually was able to intern with Lauren Baker, who's the current occupational therapist. And that was really great for me because I'm interested in going to school for occupational therapy. So it was really cool to shadow her and watch her with the kids, kind of like Anna said about like shadowing and seeing how the gateway method works. I think one of the very best things about Gateway is not so much the idea that it's Gateway for life, but it is a lifelong partnership where, mm -hmm. you know, here's an example of a great connection where your field interests aligned with something you experience and you were able to come into your, your childhood school and observe that in practice. I think that's fantastic. And I think it really speaks to the way that the Gateway is, the way the doors are open. It was really amazing. And I think one of the things my mom always said about Gateway back when I was a student was you didn't even really realize you were learning because you were having so much fun. Because what they would do in like the OT sessions I watched was they would have the kids like build things and play, but there was a method to what they were playing and how they were playing and how they were supposed to talk to other people and get along to do these projects together as a collaboration. So it was really interesting to watch how the kids probably had no idea they were even learning all these really great, you know, executive um, leadership or teamwork skills, but they really were. So I think that was so incredible to see how the teachers kind of, you know, ma not manipulated in a negative way, but just how they were able to like guide the kids into these directions. It's the idea that some of the best stuff that can be taught is taught when it's presented in this way that is non-threatening, welcoming, yeah. and totally invites that collaborative sort of work that, for instance, Luca was mentioning when the children were talking about building all together. It's that sort of stuff that's really kicks off the learning process and makes everyone comfortable with the idea of getting in and, and learning something new. I agree with you there, absolutely. Now, let's see, as we're thinking about and we're reflecting on our time at Gateway, is there anything that stands out to anyone here about how it was to be a student, to take home homework every day, to have to deal with that sort of responsibility, and then also, while that's happening, sort of negotiate home life, dealing with parents and whatnot, your own parents, and, and their feelings about your work. And is there anyone who had that sort of thing really stick out from their school experience? And I think I saw your hand go. Um. Yeah, so for me, I always I have a very uh, visual memory. So I remember our folders. I did not get Miss Polanco was my teacher, my kindergarten teacher. She we did not have homework the first year, and I remember looking at all the other kids and going, "Oh, I wish I had homework." No, that's that's a, that's not a wish. I really wish I made. Uh, but I clearly remember uh, 
the difficulties I had just bringing homework and focusing and doing it. But uh, something with my parents and our relationship is that they were always very transparent about why I was in Gateway and why my sister, uh, Julia, she went to Gateway. Uh, I went there for, I had a language disorder. So that is for uh, expressive and receptive. And so my mom explained to me, my dad explained to me what it is. And same with my sister, she has dyslexia and a whole handful of other. Uh, so it, it's definitely just to explain to me why my homework was different than say my friend's homework. It's just, it was sometimes it was hard, you know, just, uh, but yeah, once I started really working hard and uh, yeah, I knew what was wrong, why I had to go to Gateway. So my parents were always very transparent about that, but it was, it was definitely struggling. It was hard. When the homework finally did start coming, do you remember feeling a certain way about it? I imagine there was probably a bit of pride too, to, to finally have this homework that you wanted, but maybe also a little bit of gratitude that you had practiced a bit probably before taking the homework home, what exactly it is you'd then end up having to do with it once yeah. you were left with it on your own. Right, for sure. That's the thing that was great about Gateway is that they would really prepare you they would really prepare you for the assignments. It, it, they never gave us unrealistic homework assignments and that I always appreciated. But I had two teachers who were quite uh, tough. It was Mr. Geddert and Miss Nudell. Miss mm -hmm. Nudell was tough, but she was part of the transition. So she was really preparing us for life after Gateway. So that's when she really stepped it up with the homework. Uh, I used to, draw cartoons of Mr. Geddert of him torturing us with homework. So Christmas card was, uh, he was, the Christmas card was us, uh, him forcing us to count all the pine needles of a Christmas tree. That was the homework assignment, Mr. Geddert. <laughs> I think he had that. He did not do that as a drawing. I imagine that would have taken quite a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else here also have any particular memories of the program? It needn't be scholastic. I know at a certain point, the school introduced a lot of sports opportunities for kids too. Of course, we all know about Ms. Kiesel and her plays and her collaboration often with uh, the likes of Dr. Glass and the music department. Does anyone have any strong memories or standouts of those sort of extracurricular participants? Uh, Neve, I see Neve's hand up. Neve, go, go for I it love the musicals like i i think i lived for them like i i remember getting taken out of class because i was one of the main characters in into the woods like, i got taken out of like math class and to like go rehearse downstairs and i just thought that was the most brilliant thing in the entire world that like gateway like that they cared enough about academics and about the arts just because i feel like i don't really see that um and it, and it wasn't just like, I got out of math, yeah. But it was like, I was like, you guys are taking this seriously and that this is like an art form. And that was what I wanted to do at that time was be an actress. So it was kind of like, you guys are taking me seriously. This is something I could do. And that meant a lot to like an 11 year old. That's awesome. Yes. Uh, play season and that whole time of year, which would normally be about this time of year, I remember was so filled with such energy where it felt like the whole school would often be working towards one goal of putting on this performance. And Olivia, I saw yeah. your hand go up too. Do you also have memories of, yeah. of those sorts of activities? So sometimes it actually was the whole school because when I actually um, was at Gateway, there were only 60 kids, 60 in the program. So we all had to participate in the musical because there weren't, you couldn't have kids not participating because then you wouldn't have a show. So um, basically I was in the musicals and I love them because I always loved theater being in it and watching it. But there was a part of me that was always really shy about doing that. So Miss Kiesel, by forcing the musicals to be mandatory, actually kind of brought me out of my shell in that way because I had to be in the musicals. I loved doing them, but the reticent part of me didn't want to. So it was amazing that she actually inspired me to be in the musicals and that I ended up loving them. And it kind of made me a part of something. And so it was really special to do the musicals. Awesome. And, and Jordan, do you remember some of those activities too and how you might have felt as, as the school was getting ready to either be it a, a game or to prepare for a musical or a play, how that would all come together? 
Yeah, so on the topic of extracurricular activities, I really remember looking forward to after school sports, especially dodgeball and basketball, and having the chance to play on the basketball team was just incredible. Mr. Perez, I'm sure we'll be very happy to hear that. Uh, Luca, you too, go ahead. Um, yeah, to kind of go back to the basketball, I was on the basketball team for uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. And the whole entire time, it was, it was, I felt like I was part of a family. And I even um, continued that when I went on to Dwight, I was part of the basketball team, and then I went on to manage the team. But um, I, at Gateway, the... Go, going to every single game was always a was always a really fun event. Mr. Perez um, was a great coach, and just going head to head with the other schools and having uh, the team to back to back each other up, and just the the feeling you had to be there for it. Gateway really cared about their their sports, and then there was practice every day. And to really put on top of that, um, what got me into basketball was a uh, knockout after school, the knockout program which um, was a lot of fun to do. And just the, the Gateway really knew how to blend extracurricular activity into uh, student life, which is what made me really enjoy uh, the extracurricular portion of Gateway. And Jordan, you remember those knockout games too? Yeah, those knockout games were the highlight of my day, my days at Gateway. I actually, uh, then, oh, go, yes, go ahead. Neat. I actually remember um, from my eighth grade graduation, we all had to write speeches. And I remember one person said that, um, like, it didn't matter how smart you were at Gateway. It just mattered how good you were at dodgeball. <laughs> and I think that that, like, that stood true for all four years, or sorry, three years. Because, like, do we took dodgeball seriously in this school. Like, we never took dodgeball seriously again. Like it was there. I'm happy for that for that moment for those couple of years that you were able to to get into that and truly with your classmates carry on such a tradition for for the years that you were there. And Olivia, how about you? Were you in the dodgeball or did no? You have some oh, other no, stuff? no, no, no. Um, I I hated dodgeball. I was terrible <laughs> at it, and I was like the first person out like every time we played. Um, but I actually wanted to um, go back to was actually the homework question you'd asked because sure. I was thinking about that because when I started at Birch Path Atlantic School before I went to Gateway, I actually couldn't do the homework because I was so confused about the material we were learning, and I wasn't able to you know understand what we were learning. So I would go home and I would have no idea how to do the homework. So every day I would come in with you know an empty page of homework. And I basically had to wait until every Thursday when I had my tutors to help me do the homework because I had no idea how to do it on my own without an adult present to oversee the process. And so when I went to Gateway, because I learned the teachers taught me how to ask questions and when to ask questions and how to articulate what you couldn't understand. And I didn't know how to do that in the mainstream environment. And that's why I suffered there. So when I got homework at Gateway, it was actually amazing because I could go home and do my homework and I hadn't been able to do that before. And it was sort of scary going home at night and not knowing how to do the homework. So it was really amazing to actually have this skill and know when to ask questions in class so I would know what to do when I got home to do the homework. That is a rough feeling to head home and have this yeah. pile that you have to tackle. Can, If you were to think about it, can you remember any particular either, not interactions, but just style with the gateway teachers or particular teachers that sort of helped you and coach you towards, hey, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this together. And I'm gonna make sure that, you know, what you're taking home, you can handle. And I think the classes, the classes at Birchwath Atlantic School are really small, which is great, but they're even smaller at Gateway. So I think because there were only like 10 kids in a class, the teachers could spend more time with me during the day. So when I got home, it just made more sense to me. And I think it goes back to the making learning fun. So I was learning and I wasn't fully aware I was learning. And because it was a smaller environment, you know, it was easier to ask questions and it was easier to kind of start that process. So now when I go to a bigger school in a bigger environment, because I have those skills, I can translate them to a bigger classroom, whereas I couldn't do that before. So for me, um, it was just really great to have a more hands-on approach to learning. And because the kids also had learning issues, I was able to relate to them more. We were all kind of on the same page, regardless of not, regardless of whether or not we had the same issues. Whereas in the mainstream environment, you know, I was by myself, like it was just me with my issues and then everyone else was perfectly um, regular. 
So it was also a comforting environment in that sense as well. To hear you talk about it, it seems like at Gateway then homework must have felt like um, it was a daily practice and just became part of the routine. Yes. And so rather than being something that just sort of comes at you, it was something I imagine, and most all of you too were comfortable with when it got home. In terms of homework and skills, Luca and Anna, do you also have anything you'd like to add about about that whole process? And, and feel free to jump in and work together, or if Luca, if you'd like to go first. Sure. So originally, um, when I was before Gateway, I was at a school called Cathedral, and there I was um, I was not doing well with my homework. Every single day, I had to um, I had to get help um, from my tutor. And finally, um, when I came to Gateway, and uh, this came up a lot, uh, I, this idea, this notion of you of this toolbox, I, 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 my whole entire time at Gateway, I really disliked the term, but now I've come to really grow fond of it, is this idea of a toolbox of um, strategies and techniques and skills that you could use to solve a problem. Um, beforehand, I would all these techniques would be everywhere, and I wouldn't know which one to use. But once I got that visual cue, because I'm a very visual person, once I got that visual cue of a toolbox of, oh, this is it's this type of problem. I can use this set of skills to solve it. That really started to click, and I think by the end of the year, I was I was doing really well with my homework, and I even on some occasions had a lot of fun with my homework because I would be able to use these skills and really um, dissect the problem to its core and then evaluate it and use skills. So that that process was very helpful in the homework situation. It's pretty fantastic how something can be so daunting in one case where there are no tools provided, but then as soon as you have, as you describe a toolbox, a toolkit, it's easy peasy lemon squeezy. Yep. So I, I am glad that you discovered and came to embrace the toolbox. Anna, how about you? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add on to the homework, just to bounce off of what Olivia was saying about what we learned at Gateway, which is the questions we should ask and knowing what we don't know, or knowing knowing the things that we're most likely will struggle with, because I think that was the number one skill I learned at Gateway, which was, okay, I know I'm confused about this, this, and this, and I have no problem telling my teachers that I don't understand. And I think that's something I'm facing with my students is that a lot of them have so much shame for asking for help or just raising their hand and saying, hey, I'm confused, or even just talking to the teacher individually. And the students I'm working with, I'm actually trying to teach them how to ask questions because that's, and ask for help because that's so hard for a lot of people. So they, thank you, Gabriel, for teaching me how to ask for help and uh, yes. As we wrap up this whole idea of homework, Anna, I actually had another question for you because um, you have a sibling who was also at Gateway too. Was there ever a time where it was you and your sister both doing homework at home? How did that go, sharing that sort of space? And second, how is your sister doing? Um, I really don't have a recollection about doing homework with my sister. Uh, I have a lot of thought like memories of just my sister, but not doing homework with her. We were in a different year. Uh, yeah, my sister's doing well. She's very, uh, she really wanted to come on today, but she's been so busy on set. She's, her name's Julia Garner. She's on the show Ozark. She is part of the class of 2004. She went to Gateway as well. And uh, as many of you may know, she won two Emmys for her role of Ruth as Ruth and Ozark for Best Supporting Actress. So, Congratulations to her and we hope to see her again soon. Yeah. And I'm glad that there were no sibling squabbles over homework or certainly none that seared her memory. Barbies over Barbies, there were <laughs> plenty. Yes, plenty of Barbie fights. I don't think any homeworks, but Barbies, yes, for sure. Tons. <laughs> Well, let's let's shift a little bit from a little bit of the past and homework and whatnot to present day passions and inspirations and what everyone is really looking forward to in terms of future goals. Like, I don't want to put a number on it and say in five years, what are you hoping for? But what is what is the next period of life look like for each of you or or anyone who wants to answer? What's the hope in one year, two years? I'd like to be. Where would you like to be? 
So I'm trying to get my master's. I'm going to start my um, fall program at Columbia University for a master's in occupational therapy. So that's about a 2.5 year program. So for 2.5 years, it's to get my master and then to, um, you know, find a job in the um, OT setting, either a hospital, clinic, school, and sort of work my way from there. And then I'm not sure if I'll stay in New York or go to another state, but um, yeah, that's my goal is just to become a licensed OT. All right. Well, it sounds like you'll be just above us up there on the Upper West Side. So please feel free yeah. to come on down anytime you find yourself in the hood. Thank you. And let's see, um, Luca, go ahead. Uh, so I'm uh, this in the next couple of months, I'm wrapping up my time at the Dwight School, my high school. And so my my um, goal in four years is to graduate from Bennington um, right because of the uncertainty of the time, but also in college. Um, right now, I want to go into fashion design and uh, more specifically printmaking on t-shirts. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping just to either get a job at a at a fashion brand or even start uh, or even keep on going with the one I have right now. Um, so yeah, just college is what I'm looking forward to. Nice. Now, it, if, to your knowledge, or to the best of your knowledge, is New York still like, is it hot for fashion right now? Is is there particular, is this a particular geo hotspot still? Or are there other places too that people are thinking about and brands are getting started? Well, New York is will always be a culture center and wherever culture thrives, fashion is bound to find a spot to lay. But um, for the most part, I have been looking a little bit outside of New York not because it's a bad place or anything. I absolutely adore New York. But um, outside, I've been traveling to Paris and France and in the north of France to look at those spots as well. And um, while those places are known for high fashion more, I have been looking for um, street art and also uh, skate shops because a lot of the rise of street culture and street uh, wear is really starting to meld into high fashion. So I, I hope to kind of get into the middle of that and uh, try practicing both uh, high high end fashion, but also uh, streetwear. Um, I'm already, my brain is already thinking of a grandstand in the future where you come to visit and perhaps yeah. we uh, we show off a bit of this streetwear. I think the the children would be incredibly interested. I would love to anytime. Keep that in your back pocket. Nice. And and Jordan, I imagine you are knee deep in studies right now, and probably some heavy reading and then what does do you do you get a break soon well, or does your summer look pretty busy yeah so right now i'm interviewing for junior summer internships at real estate private equity firms and investment banks which eventually translate into a full-time offer for my first job so my top choices are really the career in real estate acquisitions real estate credit or or real estate investment banking and then this summer I'm interning with the development and property management arms of the Paramount Group, which is an office REIT that invests in underperforming Class A office assets in New York and San Francisco, renovates them, and extracts value from tenants and higher rents. Now that sort of work takes it takes an incredible amount of effort. Do you recall, if you think back about yourself as a younger learner, did you have that similar thirst for goal setting and whatnot, or do you feel like there was a certain point in your life or your schooling where that sort of came into focus for you and you were ready to go after that? Yeah, so I feel that my experience at Gateway really gave me those organizational skills and that discipline to thrive through writing down my assignments in the planners and tackling the easier tasks first before moving on to the more challenging ones. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Sometimes it is so easy to probably just go after the easy stuff first, but if you get that big stuff out of the way, it just opens up the road and you've got more room and time to get to that easier stuff. And Anna, how about you? What's life going to be looking like as we crawl our way out of this pandemic and warm weather is, is approaching? What are your plans uh, I'm currently enrolled in grad school and I'm working as an assistant teacher and an interpreter in a high school. So hopefully in two and a half years, sorry, yeah, two, two, uh, in two and a half years, I will have my master's in special education and I will begin a career 
becoming uh, being a special ed teacher for high schoolers or middle schoolers. Well, your students are lucky to have you and as well as the future ones you will have when your program is finished. And Neve, um, what's I, going on in the life of Neve? Where, where are we going? I, right now I'm working on an Apple TV show, but I signed an NDA, so I can't talk about it much. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I am also like looking into working a lot, like at late night, I used to work at Conan and I would love to get back into that. Um, rather than production, even though I, I love production, I just would like to see what like, being assistants are like, things like that. Um, short term, a uh, commercial I worked on is actually apparently going to be during the Oscars. So hmm. that's cool. Oh, congratulations. That's awesome. Uh, but I'd like in five years, I'd, I'd like to be a writer's PA. I note when I was looking over everyone's bios, I noticed that you had noted being a COVID compliance officer. Have you had to come down on anyone for some yeah. non-compliance? Yeah. Any particular um, stories stand out? I mean, I think just you have people here who have been working in the entertainment industry for upwards of 20 years, 30 years, and you know, change is hard for anyone. So especially for people who are like, I never wore a mask for 40 years beforehand. Like, why do I have to wear one now? But I think the hardest thing is definitely getting uh, groups of people like, you know, socially smoking and just getting them to spread out. <laughs> and uh, I think it is kind of great because I look like I'm 12. Um, so I like, I, I scare people like because they see me coming and they get scared they're like i don't even have to say anything i just look at them and they're like gotta go <laughs> but I, i'm i'm um, gonna have to practice and perhaps observe that that walk you do as you approach a group uh, for when i have to think about separating children who are they're getting a little too close together perhaps i can learn a thing or two from you about some silent signals of get that mask on and yeah, here comes mr banta please spread out can you come to my job, please? Because oh, we, have yeah. of, we have a bunch of teenagers who haven't seen each other for I don't know, six months or almost a year. So trying to get them to stay away from each other. I need to know that. I want that kind of walk. Look for a six that. foot stick. Like just to be like, not to, not, not to, like just yeah. to be like, this is how much six feet is. This is where you should be. Oh like God. people don't know how much six feet is. They're like, this is six feet, right? And I'm like, no. Wait, you, can, you, can you tell us um what your commercial is so I know to look out for yeah. tonight? Yeah, yes, what, 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 like if it's a soda ad or whatever, yeah. what kind of ad it is. It's yeah. about, I think it's like a PSA for Power to the Patients campaign. Oh, okay. So um, I think it has Susan Sarandon in it. Oh. And cool. It's like 30 seconds. It's going to be her talking about um, just making sure like people know, like, you know, how much they're like, like costs of, you know, when they go to the hospital, how much things cost so they're not like cheap, like they're not overpriced and overpaid because like that's a huge problem in the medical industry. So it's gonna be like 30 seconds and I can be like, oh my God, the Oscars. But what did you do for the commercial? Like how you said you were in production. It was COVID compliance. So I told oh, everyone to like, you know, I, I actually, I think I was, I was kind of doing a little COVID compliance, but I was mostly production. So I was basically getting everyone their food and also just making sure people were spread out correctly and not, you know, eating all in one small space. Oh, I'm going back to the passion question. I'm um, actually Mr. Banto sure. when you asked and, about and anyone, passion. honestly, if you if something comes to mind that we've spoken about as with Olivia just just come, let me know, just shout my name and we'll get to it. Go ahead, Olivia. So I was thinking more about the theater thing because I was saying that Ms. Kiesel had kind of pushed um, us all into theater and I still did theater after Gateway when I went to Birchwath Atlantic School again. I did theater um, the whole time I was there from seventh grade, 12th grade. I did theater in college. I still really love theater. I don't really do it as much anymore, but that's kind of what I think um, the other um, panelists were saying too, is about how those passions really stick with you. And that's what a great thing about Gateway is that you can really find a passion and really stick through it. So I wanted to let like current students and parents know that. Thank you, Olivia. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. So much of, I think what many people yeah. end up finding their passion in is maybe some stuff that they did for fun as a child and it, it just takes root. And I'm glad that 
for Gateway, that was one of the routes that took for you. And Gateway really pushes you, like I was saying with Ms. Kiesel, like, it, like they, they push you and I like that because I think otherwise you'd kind of retreat and I like that Gateway kind of was like, no, 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 you should do this and this is the right thing. And I, I liked that they kind of had that um, influence on us because I think otherwise, you know, you might not do those things that you would not realize you really loved and should have been doing all along. I have that, my sister experienced that. Uh, so she was part of, uh, I think Gateway was a, her debut, her acting debut yeah. was at Gateway. Yeah. Um, actually something, just a story. She, her first part was in the Midsummer Night's Dream. I played Helena, but, uh, but my sister at the time, she was, they were almost considering that perhaps she was led or blind. She just could not learn how to read. She actually had to leave Gateway and go to Eagle Hill because she needed more help with it. She now can read, obviously, but she really wanted to be in the play. So my mom told her, go ahead, just ask for a part. Go to Miss Kiesel and ask for a part. And they figured out a part for her. She was an opera singing fairy. And that was her first acting part, I think, ever. <laughs> so she has many memories. I think she played it. She was in The Wizard of Oz. No. Yeah, she was. No, I have a story about that, actually. Glinda, yeah. So she, and uh, she has a lot of memories of that. And I think just even for people who don't like acting or I just think it's great, especially if you have a fear of talking or you have problems mm -hmm. cleaning up your own words. Acting's a great way because they give you the words. You don't even have to make them up. It's someone else talking. So I think it's great just for practice of advocating and having speaking skills. I think it's good to be pushed into that a little bit in yeah, elementary yeah. school. I was thinking about Julia actually, because there was an interview years ago where Rosie O'Donnell was interviewing the Harry Potter cast and they were all kids because they'd just done the first film. And um, uh, Emma Watson basically was saying, you know, like, um, you know, I just did, you know, like theater in school and stuff. And now I'm in this, you know, big movie, it's crazy. And Rosie O'Donnell had said, well, you know, I was Glinda the Good Witch in school and now look at me. And I was thinking about Julia because Julia was Glinda the Good Witch and now look at her. Yeah. And so I was thinking about that actually recently. That's a really cool connection. I like that. That's some good stuff there. <laughs> and um, on that note also, if everyone's okay, I have some questions from some current students yep. that I would love to pose to everybody. And, you know, feel free if, if one of them speaks to you to say, hey, I'll take that one. But um, the children were very interested to to hear from, from you, successful graduates of the Gateway School. And so let me just kick it off with this. Naomi would like to know, what specific new things did you learn at Gateway? Or were there particular activities that you tried for the first time while you were at Gateway? And did they make a positive difference? Luca, I see that hand going up. Uh, so I, the second part of the question, uh, the new experiences, uh, like I mentioned before, basketball. Mm -hmm. Before Gateway, I didn't really participate in uh, sports, let alone um, didn't even participate in after school, like a little bit here and there. But when um, a couple of my friends were on the basketball team and I decided to join and this, just that community again, really built friendships and relationships that have lasted to this day. Um, it was really interesting just to uh, join it as something I never did before. And even in general in life, trying new things, I know it's the cliche is trying new things will get you places, but uh, as a person who tried fashion and instantly fell in love with it, it was really interesting to try basketball while at Gateway and just fall in love with it and continue it right up until COVID uh, when our school canceled basketball. But uh, the, the trying the new portion question really struck me, that basketball, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Show of hands, does, does anyone still um, speak with their, their teammates or, or classmates from Gateway School? Yeah. Still in touch? That's cool. That's nice. I like that. Two, uh, two of my friends were at my wedding, my Zoom wedding, and one of my teachers, she actually attended as well. Wait, which teacher? Uh, her name's Miss, Mrs. Lowe. She was there before. Uh, I think you were there. She was my sister's teacher as well. Okay. Yes, Miss Lowe. Well, I know the name, but I, I need to see a picture. That's awesome. Yeah. We reconnected. It was really nice to get to know her as an adult. 
It's different. <laughs> you have the view of your teacher, and then when you start to hear about, uh, you know, um, their children and and uh, mm-hmm. their upbringing, and just being a teacher and listening to their perspective of you, and you share your perspective of them. It was just a very interesting and wonderful conversation. And it's funny, I asked her questions about. I needed some help with some homework, and I actually called. I asked her for some advice. It was funny to have my old teacher from Gateway helping me with homework again. <laughs> I think that's pretty special, and um, I, I think that you'd be hard pressed to find a teacher who wouldn't who wouldn't help out. Yes, anyone who's been to Gateway. Yeah. yeah. Now, speaking of help, Charles would like some advice. Mm-hmm. He would like to know because he's thinking about going to middle school next year. What is the best part about being in middle school? What makes it better than being a younger kid in lower school? If you had to pick one thing, <laughs> go ahead, Neve. Uh, I feel like I need just a little clarification, though. Um, do lower schoolers, do they switch classes? Like different they, they do for their reading and writing a little bit in the morning, but for the most part, it's sort of being with the same class for most of the day. Because right I think that was the best part about middle school was just like getting to interact with all different classes and like getting to know people in different grades, at least it was for me. Uh, I remember my first day at Gateway, I actually went to the wrong class and just like sat there and like went through it. And I honestly, I loved it. I was like, okay, I felt embarrassed, but I wasn't too, I liked it. I'm glad that even though it was an oops, it, it didn't feel too embarrassing. And aside from classes, um, I also had a question from a young girl, Bia, who wanted to know, were there any number one favorite after school activities? We've heard about the knockout games and we know about dodgeball. Does anyone recall any other after school clubs that really spoke to them or maybe things you just happened to end up doing after school hours were over. At Gateway or in general, sorry? I'd say at Gateway or even in oh. general, you know, you think about the school day ending, some things I, you love to do after school, either at school or elsewhere. I did um, the speech groups that the school actually offered, like Dr. Nakari and Ms. Liko and some of the teachers that I had there, they would have speech groups and we would bring snacks. Like one kid was assigned to bring a snack each week. And I really liked those because it was sort of a way to help us with our socialization skills. And it was ways to um, you know, interact with other kids like our age or around our age. So, I mean, those were really great for me. I thought I really um, learned a lot from those. And spending time with Mrs. Liko is never a yeah, bad thing. I know. What a wonderful <laughs> person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on after school activities, Go ahead, I, remember Jordan, yes. and I remember enjoying Mr. Kaplan's sports writing uh, club to really develop those verbal skills and have the opportunity to discuss sports with other students who are passionate about it. How cool is that, that here you have the team sports, but also then Mr. Kaplan was able to come in and take something that's, I guess, a, a bit more academic, but still a bridge to Mm-hmm. the excitement of the team sports. Luca? Um, it, I think it was on Friday, but Friday after school art with Mr. Matias was uh, a lot of fun because uh, while in school you had to you had to do certain techniques and um, accomplish certain goals. After school, it was kind of a, a free reign over what you wanted to do. And if you really were passionate in art, you would get to do as much as you could. And I think the, I think it was an hour. Yeah. I want to say it was an hour. Um, was just, it was inspiring to get that free time. I'm glad you were able to get some of that. That's awesome. And let's see, as we move on from thinking about after school, I actually have a double header. Jackson and Dash would both sort of like to know, number one, was it difficult to leave gateway when it was time to do so? And number two, what does it feel like to graduate and to go through that whole ceremonial sort of saying goodbye, not goodbye for now, I guess. What does it feel like to to leave your grammar school and go on somewhere else? And please, anyone jump in. Anna, I saw your hand and then Neve. It was uh, scary. It was scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It was definitely exciting too, but it's scary. I think that Gateway is... Gateway's in a utopia in a sense. It's where it's how we wish the world was, 
And so we always have that bubble, that safe space. But for me, and I, I saw this later, is that people, once you leave Gateway, you're going to see that there are going to be people that aren't the friendliest or aren't the sweetest. And it's it, not to take those things personally, you know, because in Gateway, if you said something not very nice, somebody would point it out and you would apologize and you would talk it out. But once you leave, you have to, it was just, it was definitely scary. That's why it's important to keep friends at Gateway and uh, find really good friends once you go to your new school. And you only need one or two really good friends anyway. Yeah. But it's definitely, it's definitely, I, I wish, it's impossible to have it, but there's this, I, I like to call it, it was like a cupcake environment. It was very safe and soft and sweet. But then once you go out into middle school or high school, you know, there is that kind of shock, that initial shock. It's exciting, but it's also scary at the same time. So just focus on schoolwork. I say make a good relationship with your teacher and uh, join some clubs after school, yearbook club. I was in uh, the school news, WYRK. I'm sure <laughs> uh, knows that she went to York as well. I went to, so. Uh, I think that's good advice. I like the idea that the clubs continue beyond Gateway. And Neve, did you also have something you wanted to, to add yeah, about that? Yeah, I think graduation, I remember that being really hard for me, um, just because, like, again, at such a small school like Gateway, you really become friends with everyone. And I guess I had, like, a, a realistic approach to it where I was like, I might not see any of these people again. Um, and it was just like very hard for me, like as like a 13 year old to like know that truth. And I remember just like crying after graduation. Like, I remember having like singing, um, it was like a song from Chorus Line and like, um, like to be all at the speeches. And I was just like so heartbroken that like this experience was over because it was like more of an experience than a school. I, I went to I went to public school beforehand, and I like basically funked out. Like it was a, a bad fit, and I was fortunate enough to go to Gateway and have and to like relearn everything I was supposed to. And so going to York Prep, I repeated a grade, which kind of only like made things worse for my graduation, where I was like I felt like a failure. But I think that looking back. Um, it, I mean, it was the right choice. I wasn't up to grabs just because I had to catch up on five years of education in three years. Um, but I, I remember it being really, really heartbreaking, but I actually still stayed in contact with a few people um, for a little bit. But definitely joined clubs. I, I did WRK a little bit. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so, but definitely, I think that's super important. And I really think it's important to keep in touch with your gateway friends because there's just certain things that people may not understand, like what it is to have a learning disability. And it, it, it I don't know if you've got had this experience too, when you went out and you are with people who don't have learning disabilities, it's that you have to tell people, you're going to have to say, hey, you know what? I'm playing Monopoly. I need to play this like three times to get it. Just but as long as you don't make it a big deal, no one else is going to make it a big deal. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so for example, if I go, oh, yeah, you know, I, it sucks. I'm so bad. It's I, I can't play Monopoly. It's going to take me three times. To learn. If I just say, no, I say, OK, I really suck at Monopoly. But can we just play it? I need to play it three times. If you just say it like that casually, people won't make a big deal about it. Mm -hmm. And if your friends look at you or make you feel uncomfortable that you need to learn something silly like Monopoly, then you shouldn't be hanging out with those people. Mm. Perhaps I they need to learn to play Monopoly, Monopoly in a different way. <laughs> I don't even I have, have Monopoly. I have had a similar experience. I left Gateway because I had to, because when I was at Gateway, they didn't really have the middle school um, established yet. So you had to leave at age 13. So I left at 13 and that was so hard for me. And I was also held back a year, which in my case also was a good move because I thought that it gave me a chance to more socially and academically acclimate to a bigger environment. And Birchworth Atlantic School is still a very small school, not as small as Gateway, but still very small. And I've always gravitated towards smaller schools. Connecticut College was a small school. 
And I really think that that's important coming from Gateway, which is a very small environment to continue to be in small environments. For me, I thought that was um, really important because you still have the hands-on learning and the nurturing environment, even though not as nurturing as Gateway, as Anna said, but you still get that um, a smaller school still breeds, you know, um, closer relationships with teachers, closer relationships with their classmates. So I think that was really important for me. As a teacher, I've always had the feeling that each classroom is sort of like its own town. And as the year goes on, when you have such a small, tight community, different roles develop, different jobs and opportunities take place. I couldn't agree more with the idea of a, a small school to to help. Yeah. And Luca, I see your hand. Go right ahead. Yeah. So um, with graduation, because my graduation was uh, four years ago, uh, so I can still remember it pretty well. I remember uh, it was at the Lincoln Center, and afterwards we had a lunch at a restaurant, and then after that I was I was out with some of the graduating friends, and we all just sat there realizing just the possibilities now that we have graduated and we were going on to high school. And it's really funny because I was actually yesterday just with a couple of the same friends, and we I was talking to them, and I was like, do you remember when we graduated and how scary it was, and now look we're all graduating high school and we are graduating with the tools that we need to go out to college. And I had the same feeling with Gateway. I'm graduating with the tools that I need to go off to high school. And to really be frankly honest, that transition to high school was difficult at first, but then once I started talking with my Gateway friends again and reminisce about our, our times there, we slowly realized that it's not that hard transitioning. And then I started to get into the groove of, of high school. And four years later, I can tell you that Gateway was a really good school and it really helped me get into uh, get into a high school. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, I do also want to uh, pivot now to maybe something that's a little bit more in the, the funny or, or humorous category because Archie would like to know, is there anything you remember being your most favorite funniest moment or good time with friends and classmates? Oh. I don't know if perhaps it might conjure ideas of a play date or the type of fun things you might do on, for instance, like a field day or whatnot, but can anyone remember any really fun or humorous times? Neve? I have one that like I'm not I'm not sure if like a current student will think this is as funny as like I do as like a young adult. But I, in the library one one time, um I was with like a lot of the other girls in my grade and, and my crush had started dating this girl in the lower grade and we made a petition for them to break up. And I <laughs> I think about that a lot, but I was like, this is going to work. Like this, this is it. Like this will fix everything, and it did. It did fix everything. Um, surprisingly enough, but I, I think that's like my funniest memory. It's just like that. I was like, oh yeah, as like a twelve year old, I was like, yeah, a petition. That of course will will help me out. <laughs> you know what I love about that? The idea that you took your skills with writing, your <laughs> idea of socializing to communicate with your classmates about a big idea that you wanted to get off the ground, mm -hmm. and three, you saw it through to fruition. So yeah. in those three categories, I give you high marks for trying that on. And I agree, I probably also would have found it funny myself too, that a petition could be organized for something seemingly so simple. I think that's pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, a little bit more serious, Ms. Vidra, one of my co-teachers, she would like to know, is there a specific example, for instance, maybe something to do with math, maybe something to do with reading or writing that you learned or first practiced at Gateway that you either still use today or ended up using in the time after you left Gateway. I see Anna's nodding and, and Jordan, Jordan, why don't you go? And then Anna and then yeah. Olivia. So I feel like Gateway really taught me how to structure an argument by teaching me really how to make the argument first and then provide the supporting evidence and the examples. I vividly remember that in Miss Lewick's English class. Miss mm -hmm. Lewick, yes. And uh, Anna and yeah. then Olivia and then yeah. Neve. Uh, this is something from grade school because I went there for grade school and then sixth grade, it was taking the, if we wanted to say, uh, 
to answer a question, you would just take the last half of the question and then put it as an answer. So it would be like, uh, what are your favorite colors? And then you take that last part and go, my favorite colors are, this is a way to structure a sentence. All yeah. these years later, as I was working with children in the third class this fall, we were doing that very same thing. We were yes. stealing yes. from the yes. one part yes. to make it part of our answer. And we even called it thieving or stealing or taking from. Yes. Still, yes. still to this day, the children are learning how to do that in the same way I'm, I'm and doing, having ex success with it. I'm doing that with my students who, unfortunately, like, uh, I'm just going to tell everyone who's students at Gateway, you guys are so lucky that you're in this school because I'm with kids right now. I work at a, a mainstream high school and there are kids that have learning disabilities that have only received the help now or starting to receive the help. And unlike they're in 15, 16, 17, and they're, they're learning those skills, things like that now versus you guys learning it from a young age. And there's just, um, when Mr. Banta was asking about like, what are some skills? I don't even know. They're just implanted into my head. They're second nature at this point, but that's just something I thought of. And then we had a book called The Main Idea where we have to read something and then write the main idea. That was a skill. Summering, summarizing. The, the uh, yes, the SRA workbooks. Yes. One of which called the main idea. I'm going to send you an email because I, I need. I, I'm going to pick your brain about these things. Actually. Absolutely, absolutely. And Olivia, go ahead. And Neve, I haven't forgotten about you. Go ahead, Olivia. <laughs> um, Miss Nagaki, I remember she was the one who emphasized the importance of when you would write a new sentence, you would say like, in addition, or also, she didn't want you to start every sentence with like, I like this, period. Next sentence, I like that. She wanted you to have more interesting introductions to the beginning of each sentence to make a cohesive paragraph that um, was just more articulate and interesting than just starting each sentence with the same like three words. And so I remember that being a really important part of my education. And I remember with um, Mrs. Ginder, I, um, we were reading um, Child and Chocolate Factory in her class. And I remember loving that book. And from that point on, I started reading all these Raw Doll books. And he's still one of my favorite authors. So just like starting that trend of like just finding an author that you like and then just keep going. And it just encouraged my reading just in general, which was amazing. On two points, you'll be happy to know that number one, the children to this day, Roll Doll is still a huge hit. And yeah. second, I was lucky enough recently to observe a writing class where the idea of a word like sad was taken apart and we came up with so many other words we could use. Yeah. Much the same way you were just describing, mm -hmm. adding on to sentences and continuing the writing. Children to this day at the Gateway School are receiving that same sort of instruction and will one day also be able to use those ideas the way that you can independently now. Yeah, we weren't allowed to use, we had to stop using the word nice. We had to think of kind yes. or sweet. I remember there was like a rule for a while was that we weren't allowed to say nice. We had to say kind or some other, or generous or some other adjective. Like nice was off the table for a while. And now for us, of course, as adults, we thought oh, that sounds, so, but for the children, it yeah. makes sense. It works and we're all the better for it. And we have just so many more words to use. Neve, go ahead. I the biggest thing that Gateway taught me was like Miss Nudell was very serious about this thing. She was just like outlines, like you have to have an outline because I would just write it with no purpose. And like they at Gateway, like they made it homework to write an outline before like you even start an essay. Like they were really teaching you, you know, the first steps and a way to organize yourself, which was so important. And I like I know people who like just write terrible essays because they didn't think ahead. And I mean, I still use outlines to stay in college. Like I'd be like, okay, we're gonna outline this. Um, I'm writing a pilot right now and like write, I've outlined it. Like outlines are such a big part of my life still. And I think I learned that at Gateway and it was taken really seriously there. I look forward to your outline coming to fruition and being something that is produced someday. Fingers crossed. Also, I love that like you have like a book author that like you read everything on. Do like I that we had um The Outsiders. Yes. Season, and then I read every single S. E. Hinton book there was. Well, what's actually hilarious was I was so bummed because I heard that the kids read The Outsiders the year after I left Gateway. <laughs> 
And then when I went to Birchwell the Lennox School, they had read it the year before. Oh. So I missed that book. I didn't read that book until I was like in college. So I feel like I just like lost such a cultural, like iconic childhood experience. So I'm really glad I'm you had sorry. that because I like, just missed that. I also do really think it's important also to bring up that what Anna said about it being so, we're so lucky to have attended Gateway. Uh, I mean, I, I went again to a public school and public systems completely failed me. And I was lucky enough to go to a school for neurodivergent people and a school where people, you know, understood what that meant. And I just, I think about all the time, like where I would be if I didn't. And I, it's, it is so important to like look at your privilege in that fact, uh, because I, I wouldn't be in the same place I am if I was, didn't have that. And there are people who don't have that and, you know, are learning this late in life. Yeah. Well said. And Luca, I see your hand. Uh, it's similar to the outline. Uh, Cornell notes. Those, Cornell notes. I, I, I was literally studying for my finals, um, and I all everything is in Cornell notes. What's that? It, wait, wait, what uh, is it? Sorry. Was it Cornell oh, notes. Oh, wow. Uh, Cornell notes. <laughs> it, it was an interesting... Um, it was a way of organizing your notes where you would have... Um, it, the sec the, your notes were divided into... Uh, two parts. Uh, the first part was like a third of the page and it was the main idea. And then the second part was all of the specifics pertaining to that main idea. And it was a really interesting way. I don't know when they started teaching it, um, but um, I remember Miss Seidel, uh, I think it was Miss Seidel, kept on telling us that Cornell Notes was the best way to organize it. And four years later, it is still the best way to organize my notes. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Seidel. Yeah. Miss Newdell, actually, something else, just thinking about it. Miss Newdell taught, uh, there was something else that she taught us. I learned this at Gateway, that every time there was a new character in a book, you would start, you would underline, you would underline the new character, or and whenever there was a description, you would underline it, or anything important, and you would circle the page uh, number. But whenever there was a new character, we just would write down the name and the page number that character showed up. And because after a while, you know, especially if you have a hard time remembering things, you can just look through when you have a test and flip over the page and then you find that description of who they are. Now they have spark notes, so that helps. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Notes, yeah. Oh, well, that's good now. Yeah. A wonderful lady and a fantastic teacher. If you're out there, Miss Newdell. <laughs> yeah. We miss you and we say hello. Yeah. As we uh, think about shifting then in a couple mm -hmm. moments to see if there are any community questions, I have one last question from one of my students. And it was very important that I get it answered and I promise that I would. Lila would like to know if you're able to remember or if we knew each other then, did I used to look different? <laughs> oh, you mean like, or, do I look different from how I used to look? Uh, do I look different? Me, Mr. Banta, do you have oh. as you've grown up, do you look or feel different than you were as a child? Oh, um, so like how, how have I changed, basically, is the question. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I thought we were you were gonna ask us how you've changed, and I was like the nose ring. Uh, that, oh, that's you're welcome. Like, we can that's talk what I thought we were, I thought we were like how you changed just too. Like our view of you as a teacher versus when we were younger. You're not holding a coffee cup anymore, like I don't know. <laughs> um no, it, okay. it, in this case, the you is you yourself. How have um, you changed? Do you feel you're taller? Do you feel that you're stronger? Is there anything that you can really pinpoint and look at or think about? And I'm like, oh, I used to be this and now I'm I'm this now. Gateway was really good about, I'm sorry, maybe you should go first. No, no, you can go. You should go. Sorry. Um, it's as a school, we should be raising our hands. I'm sorry. Um, um, so Gateway was really great about targeting specific behaviors. So like um, what they would do is that they noticed that everyone had, I don't want to say a tick, but everyone would have like an issue. Like maybe kids have trouble keeping their controls or worrying about themselves, like just little things like that. And then they would give you a reminder if they thought that you were um, acting in that behavior that you shouldn't be acting it with. So like I would get a reminder if I like did something that they thought that I needed to work on. And so it was a really good way of kind of curbing certain behaviors. So I think that um, I just am much more um, like calmer, I'm more poised. There's just like, just things like that. Like they would just target things that they saw um, as being like, um, you know, not behaviorally great. And then they would try to fix them. So I think that um, I'm just like a much more like calmer, rational person than I was. 
I definitely feel though like I'm definitely more rational than I was. Great, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's probably also due to age and all that. Um, I mean, I look different just by the way that like I used to be really self-conscious and you know uh like just you know not comfortable in myself uh and I wore men's clothing and now I don't so I think like I, I look at pictures of myself at Gateway like wearing like cargo pants and like a um you know just a collared uh collared shirt and like crocs oh god yeah. and I'm like I'm really glad I don't look like that anymore. Like I'm really glad, like I learned fashion someday. Yeah, I, I dress better too now than I did then, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> oh my God, I look different, totally different. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we were talking about before, I call it the dark ages. It was just like, yeah. it was not a flattering time, yeah. Um, <laughs> but something I just wanna say is that um, I had the language problem, right? So. I kind of overcompensated in the sense of that I became fluent in a second language. And it's a language that I'm, I'm not, a, my mother, it's not Hebrew, uh, it's Spanish. And I think it's very, I'm very different from when I was a child. I still like to talk a lot and I still like to draw a lot. You can ask my husband this, it's the same. Um, but I do have to say that one thing you guys, when you're really upset or frustrated with yourself, sometimes you're going to ask like, why am I special ed? And why are they mainstream or, you know, questions mm -hmm. like that. I think it's really good. There is a benefit to this. You're going to learn, you learn, we learn from a young age that there's, that we're not perfect and that there, we can fix those things. We know what's wrong with us so we can fix it right away. So for example, yeah. I, yeah. So I, so when I went, uh, I moved to Bogota, Colombia, and I learned Spanish there as well as I lived in Buenos Aires. So I was already used to not understanding things that people were saying to me. I, I, it, I was used to it. I was used to not understanding stuff right away. And for me, that really helped me with learning a language, mm -hmm. that patience. I think that's a really unique and very cool perspective on how what seems like a challenge in one setting actually gives you a bit of pause and patience in another to be able to acquire some new information. My sister has the same thing. My sister has the same thing. She had it where she, from the from the beginning, she had the hardest life. Uh, she has lots of learning disabilities, and she really struggled with that. But she, we did talk about it before. She learned rejection and uh, yeah, rejection and frustration from a young age. And let me tell you, if you guys ever want to go into acting, I would say a huge part of it is rejection because you're having to do all these auditions. You prepare for it, you prepare, you put yourself out there and you don't get the part. And my sister was always so used to that, always so used to being like, just, you know, but she learned, she had pain tolerance in the sense, like she was able to handle the rejection. She was able to handle that discomfort because a lot of kids who are naturally gifted at things, right. That just can do math in their head like that, memorize things just by looking at it. A lot of them have a harder time in life because when they start facing things that are difficult for them, they don't know what to do. They're it's, they don't, they, they're not used to it. So just, just keep that in mind whenever. Yeah. So oh, it's really fascinating advice. when people talk yeah. about like gifted kids being burnt out. Yes. And, like I'm like, I was never the gifted kid. So like, I never like necessarily got burnt out. Like I was just like, oh no, like in fourth grade, I couldn't do math and everyone else could. But like, now I'm like, I'm doing stuff. Like it just, it is weird. Like I never understood the gifted child thing. It's like, I was like a black sheep and now I'm, now I'm thriving. Um, oh, sorry. I was thinking on with Julia actually, because I was in her class. Um, I know that um she had her issues and everything, but she was actually a really precocious kid. And I think she gets probably that gets that from you, Anna, was because I remember she was using words like excessive when she was like nine years old. Like she was really precocious. Like I think that that's the thing too, is that you know, people think when you have a learning disorder that you're not smart, either because other people think that about you or you think that about yourself. But 
like you can still be really smart and having learning and have a learning disorder. So I think that's another thing to remember too, is that having a learning disorder doesn't mean that you can't handle life or that you're not smart enough. It just means that you need help. And that's why I love OTs because it's the same thing. It's these people who, you know, are physically or mentally disabled and they can get the help. And that's why we're here is to help them. So it's just about getting the right help at the right time with the early intervention model that Anna was talking about. So important. And I mean, who knows? Look, maybe one of your students or your patients, I don't know. Yeah. What is, they might be doing <laughs> calligraphy by the end of it. They might really enjoy like, you know what, this is really painful for me to hold the pencil, but then I, they start really getting into it. Yeah. So uh, I think that's really, really important just for us, for us to find something that we really love to do. And hopefully that goes aligning with the things that we need to work on, if that yeah. makes any sense. So, yeah, and uh, I used to, tr I try to use big words because, you know, transition, they always wanted you to use different words, not bad, yeah. not bad at all. So. <laughs> She was just like, this is so excessive. And we were just like, what? And of course, I wouldn't have known what that meant at that age. And my mom was just like, wow, you know, this is a really precocious kid. <laughs> no, because I tried part of another thing that Gateway taught us was in order to learn something very well, you should try to explain it to other people. So yeah. there are words like mediocre. So <laughs> I would try to use it on Julie, I would say. But my father and my mother also really tried, they really made sure to use a lot of rich language in the home as much as they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, that makes sense. She's like a parrot. She like would hear something. She could repeat it. That's just a, that's a gift of her. She, she couldn't read well, but she could definitely pick up voices, accents, mannerisms. It's amazing. The children at the gateway school, both then and now, no doubt. I mean, they are fantastic people. They're incredibly smart. They're incredibly creative. They clearly have great bonds and love with their friends and family. I think that, you five people are an absolute a testament to that. And I know that I see it each day when I'm at work, though there are the struggles, there's also the, the, the beautiful brains at work as well that have so many strengths and so many abilities. And I think that um, it, it is a good place to be, to be able to help someone acquire those tools to make sure that those those strengths shine through, whether you're working your tail off right now through for, through a business school or whether you're now going to be heading back and becoming an OT as you're finishing up and then taking over a classroom of your own as you seek to get your ideas printed and published and out there or as you're designing fantastic things that people will wear throughout the world. I think that these are all very amazing things that require so much energy and effort and talent. And it's clear that all five of you have a whole bunch of all of that. And um, as I see that our, our clock is winding down. Yeah, I, there are more questions. I, 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 I feel bad, I want to make sure we get all the questions. Yes, um, we do have one, one big question to get to you and I'll give everyone a couple seconds to think about it. And then when you're ready, you can give your answer. And it would be the advice that you would give to the current students and families or advice you wish you had heard as you were on your way out the door from Gateway. As you were getting ready to leave, think back, maybe you were about 12 years old, maybe you were closer to 14, maybe you were younger than that. Something that you would say to someone who's about that age as they're getting ready to finish up their time at Gateway and head somewhere else. Yeah, and go so, ahead, Olivia, if you're ready, or uh, I'm sorry, Jordan, Jordan, and then Olivia. Yeah, so I'd like to echo the points I made earlier on the importance of the 10,000 hours rule reflection, but also taking the time, also being comfortable with rejection and uncertainty. Um, you yeah, please don't give in to peer pressure. I know that's like a really like trite one, but like I think it's hard also when you're transferring from you know Gateway, which is a very like coddled environment, as Anna said, to um the bigger mainstream. It's sort of easy to kind of give in to peer pressure a little bit. So the advice I'd give is, you know, you know what's right. You were taught what was right when you were growing up, both by your parents, by school, by society. So just do what's right, even if like people you know judge you for it. Like Anna said, you probably don't want to hang out with those people if they're judging you for trying to do what's right. Um, another piece of advice I would give what my father always told me is 
don't wait for other people to do something. If you want to do something, like if you want to go see a movie and no one else can go, like go still go see the movie. Like don't let other people dictate your experiences like that. Like if you want to do something, you do it. Like don't wait for other people to want to do it with you or to do it in general. Go ahead, Luca. Uh, what I would kind of say off of Olivia's is um, there opportunities will always come that you might not be unsure about. Take Honestly, take them. I took an opportunity that I thought I was unsure about in fashion and I started to really enjoy it. And it's now what I want to do in life. So if there's ever like an opportunity to which you are not unsure about, maybe you might not like it, um, absolutely take it because it, you do not know where it could go and it could lead you to a new part of life that you never realized was there, but you actually enjoy. Neve, closing I, thoughts on that? I think, um, I know like a very TV way I'd say, um, find characters that represent you or make them. Um, I think it's just, we have such a view on the world going to gateway and having learning disorders and all of that, that uh, may not be seen in media and may not be seen like in the world. And I think just, mm -hmm making a platform for yourself and making sure that other people are knowledgeable in this world and know things. I think one of the first times I like saw myself seen was like in Percy Jackson. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that was such a big, a big thing for me to like see a character who had learning disorders. And I think that it's just important to give yourself a platform and to find other people and characters who have that same that you see yourself in. I think that's the most important. Someone, I think there's a quote from Luminal Miranda, it's on my Twitter bio. That's like, someone will, uh, someone will love your story because it resonates with their own. I think talking about it um, also helps. Like, I don't, I'm not saying talk about your learning disorder every 10 seconds. Like, you don't want to not ad nauseum or anything like that. Or if you feel uncomfortable, don't. But they kind of said, like, with, you know, the idea of going to therapy, there's such a stigma to it. And the more you talk about it, the less of a stigma becomes. So I think in the certain context, in the right context, talking about it sometimes helps. Like, if you like mention it casually, you don't have to make a big deal out of it. Like Anna said before, with the monopoly, you don't have to make it a huge big thing for people to like judge you or be mean about it. But like just talking about it more, I think it just makes it, you know, just more normalized. Yeah, I, I have actually a story. Uh, <clears throat> I, I know we're short on time, but I'm just gonna say about my sister and also for myself, it's so, so important to know I guess for lack of a better term, what's wrong with you, sort of like what your learning disability is, why you're at Gateway. So then this way you can explain it to yourself, to your teachers, to people who are asking. So here's a here's a specific story. Uh, my sister, summer camp was horrible for both of us because we went from Gateway, which is a very sweet environment to like local camp, which is like brutal. <laughs> <laughs> it's just tough, yeah. Um, so with my sister, her horrible experience was is that because she couldn't read, she used to get made fun of all the time. They'd call her stupid. What's wrong with you? You're dumb, so dumb. You can't read. So she came home and she was crying. And then my, she, my mom told her, you have dyslexia. That's why you can't read. And they were talking about it. So then the next day, my sister went on the bus and they started making fun of her again. And then she stood up and said, I have dyslexia. Do you know what dyslexia is? Have you ever heard of it? And the kids were sitting there going, uh, no. She said, well, you're not that smart either, are you? And then she sat down. They made fun of her again. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, no, it's a great story. I'm not, I'm not laughing at her. I'm saying that's a great story. Well, that's what I'm saying, you guys. Like, you don't have to, you know, and also it's not like you have to be combative about it, but it's just the more you know about it, the yeah. less, the more you can do about it. And then another thing is, is that for me, I had a horrible experience in summer camp as well. Uh, because of my learning problems, the kids were doing something called Pig Latin. I still don't understand Pig Latin. I think you have to, it's like, yeah, a, yeah I don't know. So they intentionally spoke it in front of me just so then they knew I couldn't do it. And I remember coming home one day and I was sobbing. I was so upset. And uh, I said, I'm stupid. I can't do Pig Latin or whatever. And then I got so angry about it. I remember the girl, her name was Holly Berkowitz, mean girl, mean, mean, mean girl. 
And I don't know if anyone else knows her. So, <laughs> so, so feelings. I remember I got so angry. I was a pig Latin, right? And then I said, you know what? I'm going to speak the real Latin, not just for pigs, right? And then my dad said, well, that's a dead language unless you want to <laughs> go and join the church or, you know, there are other languages. And then he explained to me what romance languages were, Spanish and French, Italian, whatever. So I learned Spanish and that was ingrained in my head. I thought, you know what? I'm going to learn it. I'm going to learn the real Latin the romance language. And I did. You can do it. You can I would say not all camps are bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I went to a sleepaway <laughs> camp. I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug them real quick. Bucks Rock. A lot of gateway oh, kids. Rock too. Yay. Okay, I, I did not go to Bucks Rock. I went to like a local, like the Y. So oh, that, just, that's valid. They're ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, you're gonna, have, you're gonna have people out there that are gonna say really mean stuff, and it's yeah. like, especially for gateway kids, we're like really thin skinned because we're in such a sweet loving environment. So just be prepared for that. But the more you know about your weakness, the better you are prepared for handling those situations. And tell okay. your teachers too, like the first day, go to your teachers and say, I have this, 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 and then trust me, teachers love this. I think so. You're may I, you can tell me, Mr. Vanta. I think teachers love it when you tell them that you don't understand something and how you learn better. You just, take you take a lot of the weight off of their shoulders they don't have to worry about so much like oh do they understand do they not understand you're making their job easier so i can yeah. i can yeah. absolutely vouch for that the very best teaching is done when it's not really teaching at all it's as it has been tonight a conversation and on that note i want to thank each and every one of you thank you luca thank you jordan thank you neve and thank you olivia and also thank you anna this has been fantastic. I think that we had a bit of fun. We tackled some pretty serious topics, but we also had a little bit of humor in there too. And I hope that our audience has enjoyed listening to and reflecting upon your experiences at Gateway and thinking perhaps about their present experiences at Gateway, as well as the life after Gateway that is to come. Also, tomorrow night at about six o'clock, if you're in the audience right now and you're wondering what's happening, Tomorrow, Jason and Allison Flom will be here to present about their book, Lulu is a Rhinoceros. So if you hadn't checked them out or you want to check them out again, come on by tomorrow at six o'clock and that will be tomorrow's speaker series. Wow. All right, my friends, this has been fantastic. I hope everyone has a wonderful Sunday evening. It looks like the sun is starting to come in from yeah. wherever Anna is. Not, not very flat light here. Because we're in production, you know this is not a good angle. <laughs> However, for a bit of fresh air before nightfall, this seems like a good time for everyone to step outside and breathe some in. Everyone, thank you very much. I hope you all have a good night. Jordan, good luck with your studies. Anna, good luck at school. Olivia, have a fantastic time up at Columbia. Luca, yeah. keep designing. I would love to have that grandstand with the skateboard wear. And Neve, have fun on set whenever you can be there. And good luck with your own writing. <laughs>